So, good afternoon and welcome to the Android talk. Um, I shall be talking about the main issues we face when uh, targeting the Android platform and also some of the things we can do uh, to optimize it, to optimize for it. <clears throat> so, before we start, a little about me. My name's Andrew Innes. I've been programming for 32 years. I've been writing console games since about 1994. Um, my first job was with DMA Design, um, writing games in 8-bit assembler for Super Famicom. Um, I spent most of my career at Rare doing uh, console games on a variety of Nintendo hardware. Um, I've also written games for PSP and PC. Um, and latterly, for the past two or three years, I've been uh, writing games for mobile phones. <coughs> I joined Unity Japan at the end of last year. Um, my job is not actually anything to do with Android, but all the Android devs are really busy right now, so I'm doing this presentation on their behalf. When I was writing games, um, almost every time I got a new console or a new engine, uh, I would write a game called Robotron as a learning exercise. Um, I did this with Android's NDK a couple of years ago, and it took me about six months to do all the low-level rendering and the touching and all that stuff and get it running at 60 frames per second on my uh, target device. In preparation for this presentation, I did the same thing with Unity's uh, recently added 2D pipeline. Um, and even though I was doing other stuff at the same time, it still took me less than two weeks uh, to do it. So it was by far the easiest port I've ever done. Um, the idea was to write it without worrying too much about performance um, and in the expectation that it would be really slow and I could come back and optimize it and then tell you guys all the things that I did. Unfortunately, it ran pretty fast. It ran at 60 frames a second straight away. So that plan didn't kind of work, but I still optimized it. Um, and I can still show you timing graphs, um, but it didn't change the frame rate, obviously. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Robotron. Um, it's one of the oldest arcade games. So here's the Unity editor. I'll just give you a quick burst of it so you know what it looks like. Oh, God, I'm going to play it over here. <laughs> the idea is to save the little people and basically kill everything else. So the first level is really easy, and then it gets harder, and there's more and more different kinds of bad guys. Um, it's up on Google Play if anybody wants to have a go. Where are we? So some of the things that I did uh, to be really lazy was that when I created... Um, where is it? When I created some of the bad guys, I would just drop them in um, and allow Unity to create my uh, collision geometry for me. And as you can see, that's, that's not exactly optimal. Uh, I could have gone in and tidied that up. Um, alternatively, I could have uh, detected I was running on a slow device if the frame rate was really low and swapped that out for a circle or some other uh, piece of mathematics or geometry that would be a lot easier to test collisions for. So uh, what's the scope of the problem? Um, this chart um, illustrates the Android marketplace and every square, every rectangle, illustrates a particular device, and the size of the rectangle is proportionate to the amount of um, market share that that device has. You can see the biggest one up there is the Galaxy S3, and the, the point here is that there's absolutely thousands of them. Um, so it makes no sense to try and think about the problems of a specific device. Everything has to be as generic as possible. On, <coughs> excuse me, on consoles, it's really easy because one Wii U is the same as all the other Wii U's, and you can just write hard-coded magic numbers everywhere, um, and it doesn't really make any difference. On iOS, uh, there's essentially only three. There's iPhone, iPhone 5, and iPad, because they have the, the retina technology, which means that even though the, the resolution is, is different, you still use the same coordinate system to, to draw stuff. Unfortunately, on Android, um, you have to do it the hard way. Um, there's no option. Um, when I uploaded my example game to Google Play, 
Uh, it told me it was compatible with 4,748 devices. And every time I go back and look at it, that number's gone up. So, my slides have stopped working. Come on. There we go. Um, it's gone up about 100. You can see the, uh, the number over here, uh, 4,800 and something. So it went up by about 100 devices in the space of a week. So the first thing you can do is basically keep it simple. If you adopt the, that philosophy, what was that? Uh, you make things easy for yourself. And most of the best games, anyway, are quite simple. Um, simple to learn and difficult to master, like uh, Tetris, Candy Crush, and in the extreme example, something like Flappy Bird. As developers, we all like to show off. We like to do technically impressive stuff um, to wow people with gorgeous graphics. But on mobile, uh, that's arguably counterproductive because the, the more um, resources that your game demands and the more memory intensive that your graphics are, then the, the longer your game is going to take to start up and the slower it's going to run. So actually, you've made it less fun and instead of more. And in extreme cases, people are going to install your game and have such a horrible experience that they're just going to uninstall it straight away and give you a one-star review. Uh, obviously, that's really bad for virality. Um, on a related point, um, you should be testing on slow devices. Obviously, your, your testers need to be using slow devices, but your programmers need to be exposed to the problem as well. Um, otherwise, they won't be able to fix it. So how do we avoid disappointing people, and how can we target specific devices? So it is possible to identify that your app has uh, certain hardware requirements, such as multi-touch, things like that. And if you do it, then... Um, your app doesn't show up for incompatible devices and they can't install it and they won't get annoyed. Uh, if you have a bug after you've released your game um, that's only showing up on a specific device, then you can also turn off that specific device. But there's so many of them, you don't want to do that in, in general terms. That's basically a last resort. So it's on the Google Play. If you go into, um, if you go into here, Manage Excluded Devices, Oh, I don't have internet. So um, that's my phone there, the Nexus 4. You just switch it off, and then people can't play on Nexus 4s until you switch it on again. This is the list of things that you can filter by. There's quite a few, some slightly obscure ones in there. Um, and there are also software requirements. Um, you can specify that your game needs something like uh, a maps library. Um, and finally, there's also uh, soft permissions. So you can say you want to be able to vibrate the phone, and that way someone gets the option whether or not to allow you to do that. Um, so again, they don't get annoyed. Uh, the most important thing about those filters is what's missing. You can't specify that you need a powerful CPU or a powerful uh, graphics chip. Um, at the Android level, you can specify that you need ARM 6 or ARM 7, the, the, the CPU architecture, but um, Unity only supports ARM 7 anyway. Well, we used to support ARM 6, but the problem with that is um, on that architecture, vectorized floating point was optional, and there's no way at the Android level to say we want vectorized floating point. The only option we have is to say we want ARM 7 because we do a lot of maths. It's basically a 3D engine uh, running underneath. Um, uh, you can also specify that you need OpenGL 2 or 3. Um, but right now, the market share for OpenGL 3 devices is only about 8%. So you probably not want to do that unless you're just writing a technical demo. Um, obviously, the market share is going to uh, increase over time, so you'll be able to target them and still have a reasonable customer base. So how do we do these settings? Um, anyone who's an Android programmer will know about this, but Unity programmers may not. Um, there's something called the Android manifest file. Uh, normally, Unity creates it and uh, updates it and, and does everything you need. Um, but if you really want to, uh, you can provide a manual override. 
um, if you want to get your hands dirty or if you're using some middleware that requires that you make specific modifications to the manifest, then you have to do it. It's quite simple. You just, uh, when you build for Android, uh, it creates a lot of intermediate files. Um, you simply go into the, the staging area, copy the, the generated one out, put it in the assets directory, and then you can edit it and do whatever you like. Um, the example project that I wrote, I wanted to use Google's uh, leaderboard system, so I, I had to do this. Um, but even then, I didn't have to do um, any difficult programming. I just installed something off of Unity's asset store, and it did it all for me. <clears throat> the last filter available to you is the Android version. Um, still quite a lot of people are using gingerbread or less, maybe 20% of devices. Uh, Android users tend not to upgrade um, as frequently as iOS users do. So that's a good thing in some ways and a bad thing in other ways. Um, bad because you, you'd quite like them to use the new features, but good because it means you can look at the operating system and there's a correlation. You, you know that they're running on an old phone, so it's probably not very powerful. So you can exclude those people from your, your target, and again, you won't get bad reviews. Um, the top three there are grayed out because um, from ice cream sandwich onwards, that's the green one and the blue one and the purple one, um, Android devices were required to have uh, hardware rendering chips. Um, prior to that, um, it was optional and you could have um, soft software rendering. So obviously, if you've got a heavy 3D game um, and it's trying to run it in software rendering, it's just going to be awful. So it might be a good idea, depending on the nature of your game, um, to target ice cream sandwich instead of uh, gingerbread. That's in the Android player. Her settings, where my cursor gone? If I go down the bottom. Uh, it's in the other settings. Where is it? The minimum API level. So uh, Unity targets uh, gingerbread by default, but you can probably switch it down to here. Um, you get less customers, but you get less complaints. Where's my... Um, so, those are the filtering options that are available to you. Um, and the most obvious difference between the various devices is the size and the shape of the screen. It's certainly the difference that makes the most impacts to users, so I'll talk about that for a little bit. Um, don't think about raw pixels. Um, it's an easy habit to fall into, but it's a legacy from the console mindset, and you can just about do it on other platforms, but on Android, it's, you're, it's not a good idea. Um, when I was working on mobile phones, my boss was an uh, Apple fanboy, and he wanted to, it was a technical requirement that if he took a screenshot on his device, he wanted the graphics to be exactly the same as the pixels that the artist had drawn. And you can do that on iOS, but on Android, you would have to ship so many different versions, uh, different resolutions of your um, textures that it's, it's unfeasible. And even then, even if you did, there's new devices coming out that you'd have to, you wouldn't be able to support. Um, so it's not a good idea. Um, the, the biggest problem, maybe 90% of the problem of uh, making your graphics scale to fit the screen is your widget library. So there's a few of those on the asset store right now, and uh, Unity's preferred widget library is being rolled out as we speak. Um, it's coming in version 4.6. Um, and there's also a version 4.5, which uh, contains all of the upgrades and bug fixes, but doesn't contain uh, the new UI system. Um, that's for people who have got a game that's maybe 90% complete, and uh, they've got their UI, they don't want to rewrite it, but they do want all of the bug fixes and things. So I have played uh, with the U GUI, but I'm not uh, qualified to teach you guys about it. So, um, however, there is a man who is qualified, and his name's Tim Cooper. He'll be in here. 
I'm not sure if it's this room, but it'll be, it'll be tomorrow, five o'clock, um, and you'll give uh, an entire presentation on how to set up these widgets in such a way that they stretch and they fill the space, you know, all your buttons and your labels and your scroll lists and stuff. So what I'm going to talk about is how to actually present the game surface itself as opposed to the user interface. And there's a couple of different ways that you can approach that. Um, for 3D games, it's quite simple because the world is the same on all devices. You're just kind of looking at it through a different shaped window. Um, typically, it'll be landscape. So we set our field of view using the smallest axis, which in this case is the Y axis. And that means that wider screens get to see more on the left and right of the camera. Uh, it's typically what you want. If the largest dimension was used to, uh, for setting the field of view, then larger screens would actually be showing less, which is probably not what you want. So I did take screenshots of a slightly more complex game, but it was quite difficult to see the frustum. So this is just our Unity Chan test project. Oh, it stopped again. For 3D games, it's quite easy because there is always something you can rotate the camera and there's always something over there to look at. But for 2D games, that's not always the case. Um, this is another one of our uh, applications that we use for teaching people. Um, and it's a 2D game called Angry Chicken. And there is nothing on the left or the right of the screen, so you can't do the default behavior. Um, in this case, you have to pick uh, one of the edges of the screen, or maybe the opposite edge as well, um, to, to lose information from on the, on the larger screen, on the wider screen, sorry. So you can see on the 16 to 9 there, we, we can't even see the top of the trees. Um, this has impact on your game, so you, have to, you can't put any gameplay necessary elements up there because you just won't be able to see them. <clears throat> so... I did this by going into the editor and then manually setting uh, the aspect ratio and locking it to 5 to 4, and then manually setting up the camera, uh, positioning it and setting the zoom so that it looked nice, and then writing those numbers down, going to the opposite extreme, the, the longest one, because generally you're not going to get a squarer device than 5 to 4, and you're not going to get a longer device than 16 to 9, but you can't guarantee that. Um, so setting it to the other extreme and also uh, adjusting the camera so it looked nice. And this is the code that I used to do that. Uh, we can see down the bottom here, we have the presets for uh, the 5 to 4 screen, and there's the zoom and there's the position, and then the preset for the, the longest one, and there's the zoom and there's the position. Um, and at runtime, so I've put it in the update function here because I wanted to be able to resize it and check that everything was working OK. But you'd probably want to put it in your start. Um, so we check the aspect ratio of the screen of the device that we're actually running on. And we use that um, to figure out where on the continuum of sort of square to long that our actual device sits. And then we interpolate these numbers so it looks nice. Um, the LERP function I've used there, there's a little bit um, I can tell you about that. The, the Unity's LERP function normally clamps um, the coefficient between 0 and 1, but you don't actually want that in this case, because if you did have a square screen, then it would be outside our range, and we want to be able to extrapolate. So this is basically the same as Unity's LERP, but it doesn't do the clamp. Android devices generally don't change screen size, but I just remembered there was a case where one did. There was a Kindle, I think, and for the first five ticks, it told you the actual physical size of the screen, and for ticks after that, it told you the size of the screen minus the size of the um, software buttons at the bottom. So you, you did actually have to uh, adjust your screen, or at least cope with that. So... The third, a third way to do it, and it's surprising how often, um, how infrequently games do this actually, um, and that's to modify the size of the shape, the, the size of the game world and the shape of it um, to fit the space that's available. Um, here we adjust the width and height, but we keep the area constant. It might seem like a bit of a strange idea. Um, you might think it would affect the game too much, but actually. Uh, they do this in football as well, or I don't know if you say soccer in Korea. 
Um, a football pitch is allowed to vary between 50 and 100 yards wide, and it's allowed to be between 100 and 130 yards long. Um, it's allowed to vary less for international games, but it's still like 10 meters in either direction. Um, and football players still seem to be able to cope, and no one seems to worry too much. So in this case, I've subclassed a, a kind of widget. It's a panel. So I have buttons down the bottom and labels up the top. And I'm using the, the, the layout manager of the UI system, uh, NGUI in this case, but I will replace it with UGUI uh, once it's released. Um, and then I project the game space onto the surface of the widget um, after it's been positioned. Uh, you can see that the, the width and height of game space varies, but the area is always the same. So on the 5 to 4, it's like 11 and a bit by 8. And on the, this extreme, it's, it's rotated, the other, uh, rotated the other way. Um, so you should always keep your game units in a um, sensible coordinate system, um, which is unrelated to the pixels on the screen. Um, it's just as true for 2D games as it is for 3D games. Um, it's the camera's job to take your conceptual game space and project that onto the surface of the screen. You shouldn't have to worry about that at all. There's no speed penalty to doing that. It's not any faster to, to use pixel coordinates because your vertex geometry has to be projected onto screen space using um, one matrix multiply. And you can put any number of mathematical transforms into that matrix. It also makes it easier to think in gameplay terms about the positions and speeds and things in your game space. Um, and finally, if you're using physics, um, then that imposes a restriction on the, the, the number range of the coordinates that you can use for uh, numerical accuracy reasons. So this is the code that I used to uh, figure out the, uh, the shape of that, that demo. We've got the 10 by 10. I wanted a 100 meter squared equivalent. So uh, this reposition function is called when the layout manager has decided how big and where your widget should be. So we know the pixel size of our widget. And then we work out its aspect ratio. And this little bit of math, the square root of the area times the aspect ratio, gives you the arena width in meters. And you can work out the height um, quite simply as well. This middle bit here is adjusting the, the viewport of the camera so that it shows um, it gets projected onto only where the widget exists. And this line at the bottom adjusts the zoom of the camera so that it shows uh, game space uh, no more and no less. Um, just before I move on to optimization, I should mention that there's a fourth case, and that's if you have something like chess, where the board absolutely has to be square. Um, there really isn't anything you can do about that. You've just got to have a square board and tell your artists and your designers have to come up with some um, scalable artwork to fill the spaces above and below the screen. That's really the only solution there. So after display considerations, the next most important thing <coughs> is optimization. Um, there's a lot of reading material out there uh, relating to this subject, and it would take longer than I've got to basically read it all to you. Um, so I recommend you have a look at our uh, website. If you Google for that string there, you'll come to Unity's, um, the top page of Unity's optimization for mobiles. Um, there's quite, quite a lot of stuff in there. A lot of it was written with uh, other platforms in mind, but most of it is uh, relevant to Android 2. So I'll talk about a couple of specific Android points and then um, some things that you could do and not do in general. And first of all, you want to profile. Um, this is a pro license feature. So if you're using the free version, then um, that's another reason not to try and push the hardware too much, just trying to keep it simple. Um, but if you do want to push the hardware, then you will, need to, you will, you will have to profile it. Um, you have to find your bottlenecks before you start. Um, find out where you make the most difference if you're GPU bound or CPU bound, because um, otherwise you're just basically guessing. 
So I shall try to show you the profiler. Uh, get my game running on device. There's two different ways to connect to Android devices. Uh, there's over Wi-Fi, and then there's uh, over the USB. And if you're if you're actually developing, you've got your USB plugged in anyway because you have to upload builds. So I always just use the USB. Uh, window profiler. So this is the screenshot that I just took. Um, you can see, actually, if I can. The one downside of mobile is that we just don't get the numbers to be able to tell you what the GPU usage is like. So the best we can do is this rendering thing, which tells you the inputs to the, the, the GPU system rather than the outputs. And you can measure how many drop calls and stuff. Obviously, you want to keep that as low as possible, so you wouldn't be using sprite sheets and whatnot. Um, but you can still tell if you're GPU bound by looking at this graph here. Um, so the, the green is when we're handed over to the renderer, and it's basically waiting all the time. This line here is the six, 60 frames per second uh, line. And we can tell our CPU is basically just ticking over, and we're mostly just waiting. If your CPU goes above that line, then you're CPU bound. And this is at the beginning of the level when it was creating all of the bad guys and, and starting everything up. So we can see we were CPU bound at that point, and we might want to optimize that. Oh, shut that. Oh, actually, uh, so you connect your device basically just by choosing the active profiler, and then hopefully, am I? Oops. Oh, there's not much of a screen here. I lost the connection, so I'll have to build and run again. Oh, before I do that. Actually, I'll come back at the end if there's time, and I'll do this again, because I've got the screenshot anyway. You've seen what it looks like. So, um, probably the biggest and easiest win you've got, um, but it's also the default behavior, so you may be doing this already, uh, and that's the texture format. It really doesn't matter what kind of game you're doing, 2D or 3D or whatever. Um, this really helps. So these measurements here, uh, the download size was for release mode, but the other two were for debug mode because you need to um, run in debug mode if you want to profile. Um, uh, we can see that... So my, my example game, this, there's only one spreadsheet. It's like 2K by 1K. Um, but even then, the, it saved quite a lot of download size. And runtime memory was quite a massive win as well. But more importantly than that, the, the draw time was not quite, but just about half for using compressed textures um, as opposed to the full fat ones. Um, you're really not going to be able to see any difference. Uh, let's skip to the next one. I don't know if you can make it out, but on the, the edge of this, there's a little bit of... Um, Mac banding lines and stuff there. Um, you have to take my word for it, or you can go to Google Play and, and load it. But on device, you, you just can't see any, uh, any, anything wrong with that. So this is where you set it. It's the format there. Um, there's 16 bits, 32 bits are compressed. Just, just put it on compressed. Um, the next big win... A big easy win is the render path. So at the very low level, there's three different um, variations that, that you can choose depending on the nature of your game. Um, if you've got uh, a big 3D game with lots of lights and shadows, uh, then you probably want deferred lighting. But if you're doing, as I was, just a little sprite game, then vertex lit is all you need. The default is the one in the middle, the forward rendering. Um, and when I was doing the timings, because I haven't got any lights and shadows, forward rendering and ver uh, deferred lighting um, both came out at the same 1.6. Um, but vertex lit was about 40% faster. So in just two little settings, I came down originally 
I've started at 1.82 milliseconds from a draw time. One uh, setting brought that down to 1.6, and then another setting brought it down to 7.6, uh, 0.76 rather. So that's about 250% faster in two simple settings. On the other hand, compressed audio is a really bad idea, um, and you should avoid it wherever possible. Uh, you might need it if you've got lots of audio, um, like a dialogue or something like that. Um, but if, if you've got loads and loads of audio, uh, like a long stream of dialogue, you want to stream it in off the disk anyway, rather than keeping it in memory. But for a short um, sound effect, um, keep it uncompressed and keep it in memory. Now, my game didn't have a lot of audio in it, so you can see the download size and the memory usage didn't really change that much. But um, the important thing here is that the CPU usage for the compressed was about five times as much um, as the native. So these readings were taken um, when the level was starting and was playing the, the uh, stage start sound effect and the player was shooting. So there was only two or three sound effects, but even on a pretty fast phone, it was still taking up about 5% of the CPU, just decompressing audio. So there's the setting there, um, put it to native. Um, another easy win, again, for 2D games, but most of the uh, games that you have on Android are 2D anyway. It's just, it's just so, so natural for the interface, um, is whether or not it's 3D. So 3D audio, basically, if you have a helicopter or something, and it's emitting sound effects, then as that's moving about in space relative to you, the volume is going up and down, and then it's moving towards you, the pitch goes up. So we have to do a lot of maths to figure out um, how to change it, and we also have to distort the audio, um, and that takes quite a lot of CPU again. So you can see that's, again, 40% saving just by switching it to 2D. Um, and if you're making a 2D game, then that's probably what you want. Uh, so the default is 3D. Um, get rid of that checkbox, basically, and you'll save a lot of CPU. What time is it? Um, so this came as a surprise to me, the Android native plugins thing. Um, I knew you could call C++, well, when I was doing it with the NDK, you have to go through the Java native interface, and it's quite painful. Uh, there's so many manual steps, and you've got to get them all perfect, or it just um, doesn't work. But with Unity, you can call C++ directly from your script. There are requirements. You obviously, you need the Android NGK, etc. And the Java native interface is not required by you, but uh, Unity uses it and just does everything for you. So this is what it looks like. There's a, a very straightforward, very simple example, you declare your, your forward declaration, you decorate it like that. This is just a very simple function, and down the bottom is the C++ file. Uh, all it does is add two numbers together, and you can just call it as if it was a C-sharp function. So, where are we? If you, again, if you Google for that string at the bottom, uh, it will take you to a page which shows you um, how to do that with an example project. Uh, the page is actually quite long, and a lot of it is talking about Java, because you need to be able to talk to Java, obviously, if there's middleware written in Java. Excuse me. But right down at the bottom, there's a link to the, the project. And this is how you build it. Uh, it's, it's not integrated into the UI in the way that everything else is, but you basically have to build a shared object, and there's a example script there, it just it takes a fraction of a second and then it's straight in your game. So there is a type of native plugin called for rendering. Um, and these have been around for a while, but they weren't supported on mobile. Um, in Unity 4.5, um, it works on Android as well. And you can get C++ callbacks for graphical events, such as um, surfaces are created. And you can do your rendering um, in C++. So obviously, this is a lot harder than just letting Unity do it for you. So um, 
but the option is there if you really need it. Um, you can go down to that level. Um, this is, I'm not going to talk you through all of this, but this is just an example of what it looks like. This is just raw OpenGL. Um, you have to, well, depending on, on which devices you're supporting, if you're going for just uh, Android, then you'll just need the OpenGL one. But if you, had, if you were also targeting Windows Phone, you'd need an if um, DirectX, and you'd have to do the equivalent inside that block. It's all just basic stuff. So it might seem a little unfair because it's so easy for the other guys, um, but on Android, you've got to do all this extra work. But actually, you get, you're in a really good position because once you've got your game running on all the Android devices, then you can basically literally one click and you've got an iOS build or a Windows phone build um, or any of these other platforms. Um, so we did talk about it at Japan, so I can talk about it now, but there's a, there's a PlayStation Mobile. Um, they're looking for people to join that. Um, and the overlap between PlayStation Mobile and Android is, is quite large, so I imagine most of the people in this room, that would be a no-brainer. Um, you probably want to target that as well. Um, so I could go back and do the examples, or I could... Um, before I uh, put the call out for questions, I should also mention that there's a couple of other things you can do because PC games have had a similar problem with performance, um, such a wide scope of performance. And the way they typically address it is they have an option screen and you get to slide things up and down um, whether you want you know, more shadows or more explosions or whatever. But Android users probably aren't going to do that. They're, they're going to ex expect things just to work uh, straight out of the box. Um, so you probably want to determine that your frame rate uh, runtime and then do exactly the same kind of things that you see in those uh, uh, PC games, but you want to do those uh, at runtime on Android, something like uh, creating more particles or something like that um, on, on the high-end devices. So um, I'm going to continue uh, developing this uh, little game um, and adding more stuff to it so it slows down and uh, then optimizing it even more so it speeds up. Um, and I'll keep a blog about it. So if you're interested in uh, following any events, then um, I guess I can put a link within the game itself and you, to the blog and you can, you can watch as that um, develops. So there was one thing I was going to show I was going to show you the profiler. Hopefully try and show you actually running. So I have to set my Oh, I've got them already. You deploy to the device. Fairly small game, so it doesn't take too long. And once it's running, then you go to Windows, Profiler, and then you select the device, and you start getting all kinds of readings. It's really not difficult at all. Um, and as I play it, you can see things spiking. So that's, that's basically how easy it is to connect and profile on device. Um, okay, so now we will go to questions. If anybody's got any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Yes? 
Oh, there's a microphone coming. Just a second. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience. Uh, I have a question. I'm uh, I'm developing a mobile uh, game for iOS and Android. Uh -huh. but, um, I want I wonder about the compression of the textures. Yes. Uh, we how how can I reduce the texture size and uh, compress? So it's the, it's just a checkbox. It's either compressed in memory or it's not. Um, so, if if we go back to the slide, you can see. Hopefully, oops. Close that down. Where's my mouse? This one. Um, I'll bring up what it looks like. Uh, uncompressed and you can compare but the, there's there's nothing you have to do you just have to say I want it compressed was it was it the process that you were worried about or was it the um, distortion that you were worried about do you have a any other uh, way to reduce textures texture sizes um, so, when, it's quite difficult to see, but you can either have uh, all of your sprites stored individually, or what you can do is you can set them up with, uh, if you give them a packing tag and set it to 2D, then they all get added to a single texture. And here's what my sprite sheet looks like. Um, they all get packed into the one big texture. Um, that's a good way of um, saving memory. Now there's two, where is it? The default packer policy is what you normally use. Um, and that means that, see this one here? Um, it doesn't fill up the whole of its space. There's kind of a little space at the edge here. Um, but we render the whole thing as a rectangle. Uh, so we need to make sure that there's nothing in these bits. But there, there is a way to render, um, and it saves fill rate and it also saves memory, because in that case you wouldn't render it with one quad, you would render it with geometry which tightly fits, and that way you could specify it to tight, and then maybe that skull would move over a little bit and you would save even more memory. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Well, I finished a little early, but uh, perhaps I was talking too quickly. Uh, apologies to the translator. So, um, thank you for coming. Um, that's the end of my talk. <laughs>